Welcome to Modern Latin America in 15 Minutes. My name is Dr. Kim Richardson and today we are discussing bananas and canals, but not in that order. It should be called canals and bananas. Nonetheless, they're intricately interlinked as you'll see. Keep in mind, before we start, as the 20th century dawned, many Latin Americans began to adopt liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is a foreign democracy that enshrines the right of the individual, individualism which here in the United States especially is important for understanding our form of government and the rest of the world too. The second thing we need to keep in mind is that Latin America became neocolonial dependencies of, in the 20th century, the United States. This is important. What does that mean? That means that we are willing to use our military force, said William Taft, to protect our twin pursuits of trade and security. These are important. Speaking of trade and security, during the Spanish-American War, which we just finished, we found it very difficult if we have battleships in the Pacific to get them to the Atlantic. Why? Because they have to go all the way down to Tierra del Fuego and back up again. It's a long uh, ways and it takes a long time. Likewise, to go from the Atlantic all the way down to the Pacific up here takes a long time. And that is important because, after all, in the Pacific we had the Philippines, in the Atlantic we had Puerto Rico and Cuba. So what are we going to do? What if we could build a canal? This had been a concern, a dream of people for generations, centuries. Christopher Columbus wanted to go west, go to the east by sailing west. Lewis and Clark thought they could find the Northwest Passage. Neither one of them proved uh, a reality, and so we decided we're going to have to build our own. In the 1840s, we discussed building a canal in Nicaragua, but we signed a Clayton Bulwer Treaty with Great Britain saying that neither one of us is going to try to dominate Nicaragua. We're going to later repudiate this though, and we're going to seek to build a canal in Nicaragua itself. The president during the Spanish American War was uh, Jose Santos Zelaya. It was under his administration that we had discussed with him the building of the canal in through Nicaragua. This proposed route, as you see here, from the east to the west, or I guess you could say from the west to the east. But at the same time, another company, the Lesseps Company, was seeking to build a canal. This company here had become world famous because they built the Suez Canal, linking the Mediterranean with the Red Sea. This canal was relatively easy to build for the Lesseps Company because it's desert there. All you have to do is dig a trench from one to the other. Well, when he came and began building a canal in Panama, it was much more difficult for two reasons. Number one, during the rainy season, every place that he had dug got filled in with sediment. The rains came and everything fell down and uh, uh, refilled the trench. The second thing is there was a lot of stagnant water. Stagnant water uh, breeds disease. Disease means the workers either can't work properly and efficiently or, alas, they die of these diseases. So, in short, the Lesseps company is going to go bankrupt. When they went bankrupt, this, thanks to much lobbying, uh, seemed to be an opportunity for the United States entrepreneurs to build a canal in Panama itself. Here's the problem. It belonged to Colombia. So we go to Colombia, the government in Colombia, and said, Colombia, we would like to build a canal in your province of Panama. And Colombia said, okay, but this is the amount of money you're going to have to give us. And we said, that's too much money. Well, take it or leave it. Well, we're not going to take it, and we're not going to leave it. So they go to Panamanian revolutionaries, independence, uh, in, an incipient independence movement, and we say, hey, if we guarantee you independence, Will you in turn give us a 10 mile wide swath of land for which we can build a Panama Canal? And they said, yes, absolutely. So, deal. In December, I mean not December, but in 1903, they declare independence. And uh, the Colombian troops begin to march to crush this independence movement. We sent our battleships on both sides, the Gulf of Panama, the Caribbean Sea, and refused to let them pass. Uh, as such, it is, you cannot crush an independence movement if you cannot send your troops to crush the independence movement. So as a result, Colombia was forced to guarantee to grant the independence of Panama. 
Panama then is going to, in 1903, guarantee the independence, or I mean, uh, give us the, uh, the land. We signed at the Hayes, thanks to Secretary of State Hayes. Bunel Varia Treaty, thanks to Bunel Varia, this gentleman right here, with Panama. Now, if you think about it, Hayes is an American, Bunel Varia is a Frenchman, so where are the Panamanians in this? They are not here. Nonetheless, we sign a treaty in which the Panamanians, represented by this gentleman here, uh, give us a 10 mile wide swath strip of land, and we begin to build the following year the Panama Canal. Is that legal? Not even a little bit. Theodore Roosevelt, however, said this after he left the presidency. There was much accusation about my having acted in an unconstitutional manner. Think about it. It was unconstitutional and he is telling the truth. I did it. I took the isthmus, started the canal, and then left Congress not to debate the canal but to debate me. While the debate goes on, the canal does too. And they are welcome to debate me as long as they wish provided that we can go on with the canal. So the United States then begins to build this Panama Canal, this territory right here, 10 miles wide swath of land, build the Panama Canal from 1904 to 1914. I like this picture, it's one of my favorite pictures, in a steam shovel with President, ex-president by this point, uh, Roosevelt uh, sitting in the steam shovel. I don't know if he's supposed to be uh, trying to move it or do something, or if he's just sitting there and taking a break. But one of my favorite pictures of President Roosevelt and the steam shovel. What about Nicaragua? Going back to Nicaragua. So we were friends with the president of Nicaragua because we wanted to build a canal through Nicaragua. But once we stopped needing to build a canal through Nicaragua, we stopped really necessarily needing to be friends with the president of Nicaragua, Zelaya. Okay, so if we turn to him, he had a dream at the same time that he wanted to reunify, to reunite all of Central America into one country. Remember 1821 to 1838, it was an independent country. But then in 1838, uh, civil war, and they broke up into the independent republics. So he wanted to reunify them, but found it very difficult because each individual country claimed their own nationality and their own reasons for not wanting to be part of the unified Central American country that he dreamed up. He tried to apply pressure politically. He sent military expeditions into Honduras and El Salvador, and he clashed with American companies, especially logging and gold mining companies over concessions. So, in other words, he did three things which is going to upset the American government. But that's not the worst thing. Now remember that this is a period of neocolonialism. So his biggest error is going to be in 1909 to borrow 1.2 million pounds from European banks. He wants to finance a coast-to-coast -coast railroad. Yeah, he might not be able to build a canal himself, but he could build a railroad. And it would compete with the United States, but that's not the real thing, reason why we're so upset. Remember, this is the age of neocolonialism. We're upset because that means that he's going to be less dependent on the United States. I mean, in a period of neocolonialism, we need them to be dependent on us to buy our manufactured goods and to sell us the raw goods. So we decided it's time for him to go. In October of 1909, in a town on the coast, uh, the east coast, the Caribbean coast, called Bluefields, some Americans formed a conspiracy with the provincial governor, General Juan Jose Estrada, to overthrow the president of, of Nicaragua. Uh, he was forced to step down as a result of this uprising, and then a successor came to place, but uh, the successor too is going to be forced to uh, step down. In December of 1909, the U.S. Marines land, right there, in this uh, place called Bluefield, and then from there we're going to march in to overthrow the government. Here's another image of the U.S. Marines. In this particular image, they're embarking in New York to go to uh, Nicaragua. So we overthrow then, in 1909, President Jose Santos Zelaya, the constitutional president of Nicaragua. Again, is that constitutional? No, but this is neocolonialism. We are going to therefore occupy Nicaragua from 1909 to 1933. 
There is a small break between 1925 to 1926. So small, however, that generally people just simply argue that we occupy directly, continuously, until uh, 1933. 1933, what's going on there? The new president, uh, FDR, is coming to power, right? And the president is told in no uncertain terms by Congress, listen, uh, we cannot give you any more money to fight this war down in Nicaragua is taking forever. I mean, go back to this, right? 1909 and 1933 is taking forever to put down the uprisings. Not only that, but the people here during this Great Depression uh, are, are rebelling against it. They're saying, no more with this war. You know, the same thing that you think about when you think about the opposition to Vietnam War. There was opposition to this war here. One of the uh, problems is that a guy by the name of Augusto Cesar Sandino had launched a rebellion in 1927. His name is going to live on for uh, the rest of the 20th century, but he, he's going to not live on, but his name is. So he launches a rebellion. What's he rebelling against? He is rebelling against the United States occupation of Nicaragua. He's not uh, political in the other ways that we think of uh, political movements. He just wants to get rid of the United States. Well, in 1933, the United States withdrew our troops. Uh, okay. Uh, when we leave, withdraw our troops, we leave behind a replacement called the National Guard. And so the National Guard has one of its leaders, a guy by the name of Somoza. And the president of Nicaragua, uh, say Somoza, head of the National Guard, and Sandino, the leader of this, up, this movement, this rebellion, let's, uh, let's come to a dinner and figure out what we're going to do. So in 1933, Sandino agreed at that dinner to a ceasefire after the U.S. Marines withdrew, which they are withdrawing at that point. Well, that was not enough for Somoza. Anastasio Somoza instead decided it was a good idea to assassinate his only possible rival, uh, Sandino. And even though he had presidents ruling for the next two years, Really, he was in charge. And after two years of being the puppet master, he decided to become the dictator himself. So in 1936, he established a dynastic rule, him and his two sons, that are going to rule until 1979. And they're going to take advantage, in every negative way of that term, of Nicaragua. So, so far what we have here is the fact that uh, Nicaragua and Panama and by proxy, of course, Colombia, are going to be caught up in that whole tide of neocolonial uh, neo -colonial spread, neocolonial uh, imperial control. So what I'm trying to get at super quickly is that on the eve of the Spanish-American War, we're investing $320 million in Latin America. On the eve of the Great Depression, we'd increase that to $3.5 billion in Latin America, which is 40% of all overseas investments. So Latin America, uh, we are investing a great deal of money into Latin America. Many of those are uh, mineral resources in Nicaragua. Logging and gold mining are two very important uh, resources. But it's also things such as coffee and bananas. So many bananas are now being exported from Guatemala, from El Salvador, Nicaragua, that these countries now become known as the banana republics. We unfortunately didn't have time to talk about the banana uh, exports, so we'll talk about that in another uh, lecture. But keep in mind that all of this is the neocolonial power of the United States trying to keep control of our neocolonial dependencies. This is Modern Latin America in 15 minutes.